Hi, Steve. Hey, how's it going? Good. How about yourself? Good. That was awesome. Thanks for doing that for us. Yeah, thanks for coming. Hi. Hi, Steve. Hi, Paul. Oh, wow. So many faces. Not faces yet. Names. That Names. We'll turn I hope everyone will uh, join me in giving a, a quick shout out to Andrew Sweet, our chat champion this afternoon. One of the driving forces behind the DAG and the IDE. Great work, Andrew, doing double duty on that one. Thank cool. You. So I don't, this is fairly unstructured time. What I would love is if you got some questions you want to talk about, you can drop them in the staging breakout one channel in, in the DBT Slack, or please do feel free to unmute and ask us the questions in your mind or, or tell us the things you think we need to hear. I have potentially a dumb question. Is there anything in the works for a, a DAG analyzer tool where I have some references that skip a node. Let's say I have all my raw tables and I build up to maybe a staging table. I have some tables even further upstream that go all the way back to the raw tables instead of hitting the staging. Um, like they skip a node or two. Is there anything in the works of diagnosing something like that where maybe some older models are not hitting the correct reference tables that others should? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's. I think that's an amazing question. We think about that as a sort of linter for a dbt project so a lot of folks want to enforce rules only staging models can select from sources directly or exactly yeah fact models can only select from staging models and other fact models not on source source tables things like that yeah we think that's really exciting and compelling as a concept i think there's a couple different versions of this one that kind of bakes in let me say dbt project level knowledge. There's another version of this that like helps you cache if you ever point directly to, to source tables, like without using the source function. So there's a couple different layers to like, we think they're all like really interesting and, and worth like building tooling around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a link to Oliver Twist. Thank you so much, Eric, for sharing that. Um, I do think there's, we've seen people build something like this with the DBT package. That was pretty cool. I, I'll see if I can dig up the link. Uh, and Oliver Twist looks to maybe help with this one as well. Eric, if you wanted to like take a minute to talk about that, that'd be fascinating. There's the mute button. Yeah, so we started evaluating Oliver Twist as well. And we're not currently using it in active deployment. We're still evaluating, but it does include a couple of rules that might cover what you're looking at. So no referencing sources directly unless you're referencing them from a staging table, that sort of thing are rules that you can configure there so that at the very least you could, you know, build that into either your workflow or just make that part of the overview process so that you can flag those things. And then it gives you, it does give you a reasonable output at the end of just a, here's a report of everything that I've had. That's awesome. Thank you. I'll call on people. I'm not afraid. Who is anyone here who's the DVT cloud ID interested in the new, the new DAG visualization? I'm seeing a yes in the chat. Yeah. No more going to the doc site. That's right. We're pretty excited. We tried to build this in the way, a uh, way that we could reuse this DAG visualization in a lot of places. Just between us friends, I worked on the, the kind of DBT docs DAG visualization a few years ago. And in general, when I write code, it, it's a big, it's a big problem. I'm not a very good programmer. I'm really excited about this kind of new this new tool in our, in our belt that we can embed in a bunch of different places uh, across DBT Cloud. Yeah, Paul, you know, the source.star selector is actually not new in particular. And I did want to actually share this. I meant to share it in the chat earlier, but there's a whole bunch of really good DAG selectors that are very helpful. So I can share a link to those in case anyone wants to peruse what you can do when either running models, it works, all these work great with the DBT build command. Uh, and you can definitely use them to explore the DAG visualization too. So link, link to that one in the chat. And actually, let me put it in the DBT slide too. Jake Hannon, good to see your name in here. How's it going? It's been a while since we caught up, I think. Hey, Drew. Yeah, sorry, I just stepped away. I don't know if you are directing a question at me or just calling me out. <laughs> but good to, good to talk to you. Yeah, you're in luck. We're not calling you out. Um, or not asking a question, just like, hey, maybe, I don't know, what you think of staging? Anything you were hoping we'd get into that we didn't talk about? Um, I'll just be really greedy and ask everyone if they're on an, and I'm sure this is going to upset you, Drew, but on an M1 and on Snowflake, if they've had any success upgrading to uh, 0.20, because I have not. You know, I use an M1. It was a feat to get DBT and some other things installed on it. Any, I can share uh, my notes. Yeah. 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 That'd be great. Thank you, Drew. 
No problem. I think I put them in an issue yeah. somewhere. Yeah, that would be very helpful. I know that we've had some issues here too of a lot of like new hires having issues on an M1 with Snowflake getting DBT uh, point, uh, 0 0.20 from running. So we're actually still stuck from these issues on uh, 18. And of course, like uh, Drew was saying, or Jeremy was saying, we want to upgrade so we can have faster runs, but we're stuck right now. <laughs> yep, same here. Okay, maybe y'all have seen this already. I actually, I've been installing DBT in, in kind of development from source as we're playing around with some of these pre-releases. So I actually don't know that I've installed O21 with Homebrew in particular yet, but I dropped a link in the chat to what kind of worked for me with O19.1, I think, when I last tried. Awesome, thanks, Drew. Yeah, you got it. If that doesn't work for you, we'll jam on it together. So two I saw questions in the chat. Did you Thanks see that? that? Yeah, go <laughs> so for one it. Is, start? Yeah, so one is metadata plans, getting it into the database, and the other is column level lineage, which I also love talking about. So in terms of plans of getting it into the database, it's not, uh, we don't have short-term plans of getting it in, into the database. I'd love to chat with you, Dan V, a little bit about how you would use this metadata information in the database. We're open to it. We've heard this before. We're thinking about it right now. We're still building out the API to have a lot more functionality to allow for the historical run. So we have a lot of work to do, but I definitely see the value add of having it in the database. It's just not in our like short-term plan. Drew, do you want to add anything there? I can speak to the column level lineage question. Um, uh, yeah, I'll add, uh, Christian, I'll add a link to the documentation in the chat. I have a couple of different like white whales, call me Ishmael, and uh, column level lineage is definitely one of them. We are, we're like poking at this today. It turns out it's a really deep and challenging problem to, to do column level lineage in a way that works across all the different databases that the DBT supports. And in particular, one thing that makes it really hard is that your know, DBT model code has, has both Jinja and SQL in it. So trying to parse and analyze all of that code and build up this lineage for, for columns, a really deep and challenging problem. So I don't think we have any updates in particular to report at this point, but do want to be clear that as soon as we do, we're going to be sharing them far and wide because we think it's an exciting and impactful kind of problem space to dig into and the things we can build with it in terms of linting, like we talked about, the sort of naive versions are, do you have any direct references to tables that should be refs or sources, but also you can do things like, like code quality enforcement. So taking these style guides that are marked down documents and actually enforcing them. There's some other tools that can do parts of this as well. If you haven't seen SQL fluff, I think they've gone pretty deep on this. And maybe the thing to say is like SQL linting and column level lineage are actually fairly similar problems. So it's cool that we can make progress on both of those together. Yeah, really cool. Awesome answers. Thanks. On the metadata um, bar as a follow-up to that. I, so we're trying to match up DBT metadata. So sort of like what that API provides, but along with that, match it up to our replication tool. We happen to use five trim, whichever tool we're using, lining up when's the last time data got replicated with the last time DBT ran. So we can actually figure out sequencing and things like that, or just keep track of sequencing, not even figure it out, but, and then match up with whatever other metadata we might have coming from other sources as well. Yeah, I totally buy that, that it's more like more informative and powerful if you understand what's happening upstream and downstream. Yeah, and it's, it's it'll be really powerful if we can keep our development focused in DBT and not, you know, have to carve someone out to develop some sort of API fetch kind of thing to, to get the data into our, our data warehouse. Yeah, that makes sense. I buy it. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to chat more if you want to follow up with me. Um, I'll, I'll Got any other questions for me or anything? So I do have a question for the column level lineage group. When you think about column level lineage, if this is something you, you or your organization are really interested in, what's the smallest version of it that feels helpful to you? What's the number one thing that you're looking to get out of column level lineage? And maybe if we could jam on this in the, in the DBT Slack, then we can keep the conversation going even after this ends in eight minutes. I will all say for, for me and for my company, we want to use it because we have a lot of derived definitions, you know, that we do from pull from various sources to say, this means X in this variable, this means Y for this variable for defining whatever metric we're trying to define. And mostly it's starting out to use SQL to be able to derive and define metrics that we'd want to eventually put into the product. And not only that, but we want 
to be able to surface up what we're using to derive some sort of business logic. Because obviously I could say things like what defines a new customer. There could be various things people put into that or existing, just basic things like that and even more uh, intricate things. And be able to serve up like a column level lineage, like it's like to call them. Okay, what are all the downstream sources, every single source table? What are you actually doing to that? Are you using a case statement? Are you using a whatever, whatever formula? We just want to be able to surface those SQL formulas when you click on it in whatever we want to serve it up in, in Tableau or Metabase or something that you build yourself, be able to, be able to select the column or select the metric name, the column name, and have the full lineage all the way back to the, the very like raw source. So everybody knows where it's coming from. And then eventually if a software engineer picks that up to develop feature in their product, they can see everything there in one click and then just be able to iterate and, and fix things faster. And also bring new hires up to speed faster because they can see that SQL instead of having to go into the, all the source tables in DBT. Yeah. Okay. So it really is like all the transformations on top of the source columns that end up contributing to like some derived column somewhere in a downstream model. Correct. Okay. Hey, hey Drew, can I yeah. jump in? Yeah. So I think to, to answer your, your question as far as the bare minimum, I think something like a date and an annotation saying that this column changed would be helpful to say if the data itself doesn't match and you have a historical, then it at least gives us an idea on why we can go back and look at a change log. Okay, that's interesting. I think a lot of, it's hard to know, like a lot of the times when something changes, it's less about if someone changed the logic for this particular select statement and more something upstream changed. So that's neat. That's interesting. Being able you to know, understand the impacts of those changes, yeah. I, I guess I can give, even using you know Joseph's example just a second ago, if the definition of what a customer is has changed because of some business determination upstream, then even having a notation would tell them this is not an error or a bug in our graph or our data in our Tableau or whatever. It's because something changed and it's expected and you can go look into wherever we store that offline at the moment until it's built into DBT. Or in our case, we have things like what's considered uh, an acceptable order or an opportunity that might change uh, based on what the current leadership's looking at. And so we want, want to use the same definitions, but sometimes those definitions change from under our feet. Being able to know when that changed and point to that saying, hey, look, that's not a problem with the data or our analysis or what we put together. Here, go look at and it at least points at something else that we can look at and not chase down red herrings. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I think change, yeah, came, change captures is really very interesting. And there's like, like levels of Zoom you can apply. So I think today we could do the version of the this is the git commit in which the model containing this column changed, you know, or, or something like that. But, but yeah, being able to zoom deeper and, and it sounds like annotate those things too, like not just the code change, but also like what, why did this change? That feels really interesting. And for the record, I agree with Joseph. I'd really like to see all the logic and the case statements and all the stuff that changed, but I really realized that might be an iterative and you asked for the minimum. So I'm yeah, suggesting yeah. that. It's funny. It's once you start getting into SQL parsing, it's like step one is actually just build a, SQL parser that supports the entirety of the SQL grammar, <laughs> which is not published by most databases. So it's like tough when that's step one. The cool thing is in playing around with these internally and talking to other folks, like people rag on SQL sometimes for not being quite as expressive as, as other kinds of languages, but it also has relatively few moving parts. So it's an advantage there. Okay, cool. We, yeah, if we make any progress here, it's definitely the kind of thing where we're not going to want to do it in a vacuum. It's the type of problem that I think is like very creative towards community like development and input insofar as you actually build a different parser for snowflake versus redshift versus BigQuery versus and so we, we likely want to make sure it's open in, in development and, and that we can collaborate with a bunch of folks and build a framework that people can tap into good question from the slack what would it take for exposures to not be handcrafted do you see that as something that BI tools should build and emit back to DBT, something that we take on somehow or maybe something else? Bar, have you given this one some thought? Yeah, I think we should. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have a better answer for that. This will happen in Q1, but I'm, I, I am, I'm trying to see who asked this question. This is Joel. It was Joel. Yeah, Joel. I think it would be a really good end state for exposures to not need to be 
manual. In terms of like the path to get there, there are still some open questions, but I'm very much there. Yeah. So I wonder, Barb, we have the metadata API. It's like, I don't know. The, I feel like one of the big questions in my mind is we love version control because it helps you understand how things are changing and you can improve it over time and manage merge conflicts and things like that. But once you get away from, I actually don't want to define this manually, then version control gets in the way. So I'm wondering, is it the kind of thing where we're open to these exposure definitions not being version controlled, or are we more looking for a process whereby exposures can be created and updated and, and maybe deleted programmatically inside of a, a Git repository? That's my big question that would unlock what we do about this. And we'll just keep thinking about it. We'll just keep pondering. Cool. Sorry, yeah. just another concern is on the point of version control, folks right now are manually opting into their most kind of like their highest level dashboards, potentially depending on how much time they're spending in exposure land. And so how do we also make sure that uh, we're not drowning in exposure noise, let's call it. Yeah. Uh, so all good things to think about. Well, um, so we're right up on time. Uh, thanks everyone for coming today. It was good talking to you. We don't need to end the conversation. Semi Sonic said, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So we'd love to talk to you more about this in the GitHub issues or in, in DBT Slack or all the other places you might find us, um, Twitter, TikTok, you name it, we're there. So thanks again for coming. Good talking to you and hope you have a good rest of your day.